Chapter 10, Human Development Across the Lifespan, Lecture 2. Basic questions we're going to be addressing in Lecture 2. Are there set stages of cognitive development? Are there set stages of moral development? What are the various criticisms of the stage theories? What are the physical and cognitive changes associated with aging? So how many of you have played this game with a little one? I remember doing this with my daughter and she was delighted. As long as I would play this game with her, she would play with me. So I'd take a ball and say, see this? Put it behind my back, where'd it go? So on and on this would go until I would get tired of it usually. But now, as a teenager, if I tried to do this with her, she would be offended and she would probably leave and go to her room, being very frustrated with me. I'm not a child anymore, Dad. So what happened? What happened? How do we change over the course of our lifespan? This is maturation. We talked about maturation and development a little bit last time, how we change and how we, in some instances, stay the same over the course of the lifespan. So what happened to Peekaboo? A couple of different ways you can look at development or maturation, continuous versus stage models. So on the left, you have the continuous development. So in, on the one hand, we can view development as being sort of continuous. That is, it's not marked by particular uh, points in time where an individual is doing one thing and then all of a sudden they're doing something else and they're not doing uh, what they previously did all of a sudden, although it may seem like that sometimes. So where did, where did Peekaboo go? I don't know what happened to Peekaboo, but I don't remember when she stopped wanting to do that, my daughter, but uh, I just know that now she doesn't want to do that anymore. It was somewhere back in her early developmental history that Peekaboo ceased to be enjoyable for her. Um, although I cannot tell you exactly when. And then the stage theory you can think of as uh, a series of events that occur within a particularly well-defined period of time and then there's a transition to into another uh, set of events that happens fairly predictably across individuals so those are the stage theories that is development is discontinuous occurs in stages there's particular things happening at particular times a couple of different ways to look at maturation we're going to look at the stage theories some of the earliest theorists on development were stage theorists. So we're going to look at some of the big theorists and what they came up with. And, uh, and then we're going to talk about some of the limitations of the stage theorists. And then I'm going to give you a short discussion of what you have to look forward to if you're a young person. So first stage theorist we're going to talk about is Jean Piaget. Jean Piaget was very, very influential thinker in developmental psychology, did a lot of research with kids, hands-on. And we're going to talk about his cognitive theory of development, that is, how we think and, and the nature of thinking and so forth changes over the course of time. And Piaget identified four stages of cognitive development. So the first stage is the sensory motor stage that's occurring zero to two. Uh, kids lack what Piaget called object permanence, and this is a partial explanation of why kids like to play peekaboo, is that you show them a ball, and then you put it behind their uh, behind your back, and for them, because they lack object permanence, the ball ceases to exist. It disappears, and it is gone. And there's something delightful about this, that things just cease to exist and then they reappear uh, and it's delightful because kids have that a sense that the thing is just gone it ceases to exist presumably and so they lack object permanence and then this is resolved around 18 months that is they stop being so delighted with peekaboo because they they realize that the thing has not evaporated but rather uh, they might pursue it uh, reach out and try to get it from you um, or try to look and see where it is. Uh, and at that point, you could say that they've achieved ob object permanence. So kids are getting a sense of 
uh, stuff in the world and, and are able to maintain uh, mental representations of objects uh, that are no longer in view. Coordinating sensory input with motor behavior, and I'll tell you a little story. When my daughter was born, I keep bringing my daughter into this because it's relevant, I suppose, personally relevant. Some of you may have kids. But I brought my daughter home. She didn't do a whole lot. And then I remember somewhere around six months, I think it was, uh, she was sleeping in her little bassinet. And we had a mobile up above her and with things hanging down that were interesting to look at and so forth. So I see this little foot go up and kick. And I thought, oh, that's just a kind of a random kick. And then sure enough, it happened again. And I determined that she was trying to make that mobile move. So she was coordinating sensory input with motor behavior. Presumably she say, she saw the object out there and then she was able to maintain that mental representation in mind and reach out with her, her, her leg and try to make something happen out there. And for us, we might think, ah, oh, that's no big deal. We do that all the time as adults. But for little kids, this is a major developmental leap to uh, have a, a sensory input that is visual input and then translate that that visual input, that sensory input into some sort of motor behavior. Reach out for something. Make something happen. This is huge. So that's what's happening. One of the things that's happening during sensory motor, gradual appearance of symbolic thought. So kids, um, one to two years of age, development of language is huge. Right? So signs and symbols, these are signifiers. Utterances, dada, mama, are reliably used to refer to concrete objects and events. So kids are beginning to connect uh, abstract things like an utterance with an actual tangible object out there. Symbolic thought. So pre-operational is the second stage is two to seven years developmental symbolic thought continues more language. So kids, and this is the beauty of language development is that you can actually begin around four years of age. For some kids, it's sooner. Uh, very verbal kids, it's sooner than this. Kids are able to understand most sentences. They can use sentences that are four or five words long. They can say their name, their age, their sex, and use pronouns. So not only are they developing language, but they're also developing this sense of who they are, this sense of me or I, by using these pronouns. And they're also developing a sense of you out there, or it. PSA often focused on the limitations. That's things that kids aren't able to do at the various stages. So one of the things that kids aren't able to do very well is solve what are called hierarchical classification kinds of problems. So here's an example of a hierarchical classification kind of problems. Uh, so if I give you five roses and three carnations, do you have more flowers or more carnations? So if you think about that question, if I give you five roses and three carnations, do you have more flowers than carnations? And the answer would be yes. Because we can see that flowers are a higher order category that contains that we can locate both carnations and roses with that. But kids of this age have difficulty engaging in that sort of higher order classification. They will be confused. However, if you explain it to them, like if you take a six-year-old and you give them that problem, and you explain it to them thereafter, more often than not, they'll get it wrong. But if you explain it to them thereafter, they will get it in many instances. But initially, they have trouble. They have trouble with conservation kind of problems. And I'm going to flip the slide here and show you sort of a classic type of conservation problem. So here we have two beakers, and we set before this child two beakers with the same amount of water, A and B. And then we pour the water from beaker B into a tall, skinny beaker C. And then we ask the child, do beakers A and C contain the amount of same amount of water? And as adults, we would say, yeah, they do, because Look, uh, we started with A and B having the same amount, and then we just poured B into C, 
And even though B or excuse me, C is tall and skinny and, and higher and taller and so forth, uh, it contains the same amount. The actual physical quantity amount hasn't changed just because the shape of the container that it is uh, housed within has changed. But kids of that age, two to seven, will have trouble answering this kind of question. They will reliably say that C has more water than A because it just looks bigger. It looks bigger. And this is a good reason why that if you've ever done this, you have two little kids in this age range and you give one a, uh, one a big bowl and one a little bowl and then you put exactly the same amount of ice cream in each bowl, you're certainly going to get some arguing. The one with the little bowl is going to say, he got more than I did. And there's no amount of explaining or rationalizing it away. They just will not get it. So use the same size bowl or you're headed for trouble. So kids have trouble with these kind of conservation problems because of centration and irreversibility. So you can think of a centration as being able to focus on only one aspect of the problem at the same time. So they will sit there and focus on the fact that C looks taller and, you know, it's just, it's got more. They won't exactly be able to explain why C has more than A, but they will certainly continue and they're, they're, they will perseverate on that. They'll get stuck on this part, that centration. And then they lack what's called reversibility. Uh, irreversibility is the inability to walk yourself back through the steps. So as an adult, we can say, all right, What's the question? A and C contain the same amount of water? Okay, so what do we do? We poured B into C, and then I can see that A and B had the same amount that uh, at the beginning. So I've walked myself right back through the problem to the beginning, and I can see that clearly A and C do have the same amount of water. So kids get hung up on one aspect of the problem. They can't reverse the order of the problem. Next, concrete operational, ages 7 to 11 years. So here we have mental operations still applied only to images of tangible objects. That's why when you see, if you go into a classroom, uh, you might see kids learning number and, uh, in, 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 in mathematical operations like addition. So here we have, uh, if I have three duckies and two more come along, how many duckies do I have total? And the answer would be five. Uh, so the, the, if, I, if I said, what's 3 plus 2, number is an abstract thing. And kids of this age range have difficulty, some difficulty engaging in abstract thought. And so we have to link a number to actual tangible objects. So they have to go 1, 2, 3, and then two more come along, 4, 5. Difficulty imagining outcomes of what-if scenarios if they are not anchored to things that can be seen and touched in the real world. So if we ask a kid in this range, and of course there's individual differences, but if you ask a kid in this range, what do you think it would be like if people did not have thumbs? Well, you might get an answer like, well, it would be very difficult to hold a pencil. Um, you ask an, uh, <clears throat> a kid, a 15-year-old, this question, they might go on and on and on imagining all the implications of not having an opposable thumb. They might know something about uh, biology and evolutionary development and the importance of having that opposable thumb for tool making and tool use, for example. Everything hinged on that, that hinge, that opposable thumb. So you get a very, very marked difference in sort of possible scenarios uh, across ages. And the reason for that is, is that imagining possible worlds and possible scenarios involves a level of abstraction away from the tangible. They do have mastery of conservation, so they can solve those kind of conservation problems relatively easily, uh, characterized by decentration and reversibility. So in essence, they can focus on more than one aspect of the problem. They don't get hung up like they did earlier, and they can walk themselves back through the steps of a problem. And then they can solve those hierarchical classification problems fairly readily. And then the last stage here, formal operations, 11 to adulthood. That's us, presumably. Uh, mental operations applied to abstract ideas. So here the ability to think in abstract terms is enhanced and continues to be enhanced as we develop uh, so that means if we ask a kid 
to imagine a hypothetical situation, they, they'll be able to come up with all sorts of interesting possibilities uh, without actually observing or enacting the scenario in a con concrete way. So again, if you ask a 15-year-old what would the world be like if we didn't have thumbs, they might come up with incredibly detailed and, and abstract scenarios. And this is why you see math, like pre-algebra and so forth, coming, uh, entering into the curriculum. Uh, kids uh, of the <clears throat> concrete operational stage have difficulty understanding variables like x and y and so forth, and that they can stand for a potentially infinite number of quantities or even qualities. Um, so this formal operational period is characterized primarily by this ability to engage in abstract thought and also in the way that kids approach and individuals approach problem solving. So here we have logical systematic thinking and problem solving coming online as opposed to simple trial and error, which is the default strategy of many kids younger than this age. So a lot going on cognitively with respect to development. Concept check for us here with respect to these developmental stages. One, mental operations still applied only to images of tangible objects. So which stage of development is characterized by this? Answer is concrete operations. Number two, Logical, systematic thinking, problem solving instead of simple trial and error. Which stage of cognitive development is characterized by this? That would be formal operations. Number three, coordinating sensory input with motor behavior and developing object permanence. Sensory motor stage in the last one, no mastery of conservation. Answer is the pre-operational stage. So those are the stages of cognitive development. I want to shift to talk a little bit about moral development. So we talked a little bit about how kids change with respect to their ability to think in particular ways and solve kinds of problems. Now we're going to talk a little bit about Lawrence Kohlberg, Lawrence Kohlberg's stage theory of moral development. And you can think of it as parallel, paralleling cognitive development. So I've got to be able to engage in abstract thought, for example, to be able to step back from a law and think about it in kind of an abstract, relative way. So Kohlberg's stage theory of moral development maps on, to some extent, with Piaget's theory of cognitive development. As we change in the way we're able to think, also will change in the way we determine what's right and what's wrong, the way that we think about what's right and what's wrong. And that's essentially what morality is, questions of morality. How do we decide what's right or what's wrong? So these are some basic issues that we see over and over again. Abortion, where do you stand on abortion? Some of you may have fairly strong uh, thoughts and feelings about that, the death penalty, gay marriage. So these are sort of perennial uh, platforms or planks in the platforms of politicians that we see over and over again because they're important to a lot of different people. So where do you stand? So these are questions of morality to some extent. What's right and what's wrong? So Lawrence Kohlberg developed a stage theory. Uh, he studied the nature and progression of moral reasoning, that is, the way that we think about right and wrong. So you can read about these in your text, but I'm going to talk about the three sort of overarching uh, stages, the pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional stages. And we'll see in a moment how these parallel uh, maturation age. So pre-conventional morality is external to the self. Right and wrong are linked to reward and punishment. So you see this in young kids, that what's right is that which gets rewarded, what's wrong is that which gets punished. The conventional stage, following pre-conventional, doing the right thing involves living up to the expectations of others, obeying the rules of society, rule of law. So you see this 
and young kids as they move out and enter school, they begin to learn about uh, social rules, conventions, and so forth. They learn about the law and government. And their idea about what's right or what's wrong has more to do with how society views right and wrong, the rules of society, the rule of law, so to speak. The fundamental basis of a civil society is that there are rules that we all agree upon and then we also agree to follow those rules. And then the last is a post-conventional stage. Presumably this is the stage most adults are at, according to Kohlberg. Uh, and this involves the ability to step back from society and consider the rights and values that society ought to uphold. And the way that we reason about what's right or wrong is often based on our own personal code of ethics. That is, there may be a law that's on the books that I don't feel is a good law according to my own personal code of ethics, and therefore I may choose to disobey that law or uphold it, as the case may be. So these are the three stages of moral development, and they're linked to age. So what we're looking at here in this image on the x-axis is age. So on the x-axis, you can see that age is advancing. And then on the y-axis, we have the fraction of the subjects, these are research participants, falling into one or the other of those stages. So let's take a look at pre-conventional. So what this is suggesting is that when we look at uh, kids age 7, that most are in the pre-conventional stage, and that kind of makes sense. And this is prior to that as well, that kids are reasoning or thinking about right or wrong with respect to what gets rewarded and what gets punished. Uh, and then you see what happens with age as age advances, advances the fraction of kids falling or people falling into that category declines. And then we see uh, conventional on the rise. So this is around age seven kids are in school. They're learning about rules and getting along with other people and about the police and government and all that. And, uh, and uh, you, uh, so the rules of society are taken into consideration when kids are, are making a decision about what's right and what's wrong. So you see at stage seven as pre-conventional, the fraction of kids falling, people falling into pre-conventional declines, we see conventional on the rise. And then we see post-conventional around age 13, or excuse me, around age ten. Or around age ten, you see that the fraction of of people falling into the post-conventional stage increasing, and around age thirteen, uh, we see conventional declining. So what that suggests is that both pre-conventional and conventional uh, will decline with age, whereas post-conventional, if we can sort of extrapolate this this line so that it, continu it continues on, that we would expect more and more people as we mature and age to land in that post-conventional stage. And sort of the height, according to Kohlberg, of moral development is our ability to step back from the law and consider it in an abstract sense. And that's kind of what we're doing when we have uh, conversations, sometimes heated conversations about issues like abortion, is issues uh, such as the death penalty or gay marriage, the fact that we're able to have conversations about this and sometimes arguments and debates is that we can consider law in an abstract sense. Uh, what's, what's a good law and what's a not so good law? And, and then make that determination based on our own personal code of ethics. Stage theories, the pros and the cons. So one of the, one of the upsides of these big stage theories of development are that they've produced tons of research. So Piaget and Kohlberg, under their theories, and this is sort of the hallmark of a good theory, is that they produce a lot of research, a lot of thinking going on based on these theoretical ideas. Uh, the downside or the cons, difficulty accounting for individual differences. So Piaget and others had these fairly well demarcated stages, but could be that you find yourself or you observe another being in one stage uh, and the other at the same time, or maybe one stage uh, you skip the stage or you're, uh, you regress to a, 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 from a higher stage to a lower stage at, at some time. 
Um, so this is called stage mixing, and it's difficult to account for these kind of individual differences. Why do we see if we're all sort of sort of unfolding according to these pretty well demarcated periods of time? Why do we see this these individual differences? Uh, methodological issues, and this is how the uh, some of the, the the characteristics of the theory or the ideas, the predictions based on the theory are tested, uh, and also the development of the the theories themselves. Uh, there are some methodological issues that need to be considered. Uh, Kohlberg, for example, uh, exposed his participants to moral dilemmas. These were stories that put an individual or individuals in a uh, situation where they had to choose uh, a course of action, and then it was up to the research participant to determine whether it was uh, the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. And one of the criticisms of, of Kohlberg's procedures was that they were culture specific and that they reflected Western individualistic liberal values. And, and that is, uh, in some cultures, it, it may not be that the height of moral development is the ability to judge a law that's in place as a result of lawmaking according to our own personal code of ethics. That could be the, uh, the low point in one's moral uh, development. Uh, in some cultures, individuals place society and the rules of society and understanding how our role as individuals in society is to act according to those expectations. That's the height of moral development. And to go off and do your own thing and, and be a relativist is sort of a low point. Uh, so this is the, the Western individualistic liberal values. It's sort of all about me. Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, and they contain value judgments. That is, we value a particular approach to determining whether something is right or wrong based on our own uh, uh, socialization. Uh, and part of socialization includes uh, value, uh, developing value judgments. Um, Piaget also under, in, underestimated influence of cultural factors. So, um, as always, you know, some of this early research was uh, confined pretty much to uh, convenient samples that his Piaget did a lot of his work with kids in France. So, the idea is that, oh, if I discover certain, what I believe are certain principles of development, uh, stages and so forth uh, in this population, can I, can I, reliably generalize to the rest of the human species? And the answer is no, probably. You can't. Um, there are cultural differences and cultural factors that influence even the cognitive development. Uh, new research inconsistent with past findings, and this is always the bane of a good theory. It's also part of science that somebody hatches a theory based on a series of observations, object permanence, for example, that kids, according to Piaget, were not able to maintain mental representations of objects in their minds. That's why when they disappear, they're gone for good. They cease to exist. But the actual fact is that more, more recent research suggests that kids might develop object permanence earlier than Piaget had claimed. That is, kids can retain mental imagery. But the problem is that they can't translate that mental imagery, for example, the, the image of a ball that's a visual stimulus into motor behavior. So when you put the ball behind your back, the problem is not that they can't maintain the image of the ball, is that they can't quite figure out how to reach for it. That's the problem. So sometimes findings crop up that are inconsistent with the, what, with what a theory would predict or inconsistent with past findings of theory. And then what do we do? Usually we don't scrap the theory altogether, but rather maybe new theories develop um, and then prior truths and findings and, and things that we thought were the case uh, have to be adjusted according to new data. All right, so looking ahead into the future. So this is what we can expect as we develop, as we emerge as humans, personality development, 
Uh, for example, the sense of identity, how we answer the question, who am I, we can expect that to change. I mentioned at the beginning of this, I'm not the same person. That is, I don't answer the question, who am I, the same now when I'm 50 or almost 51 as I did when I was an 18-year-old. So you can expect your personality to change. Some parts of it will stay the same. So if you have a if you were if you were a difficult baby, you have a difficult temperament, you'll probably be a difficult person, old person. Uh, but certainly your sense of identity will, will likely change. Some parts of it will stay the same, but you can expect that self-definition to, to vary over the course of your development. Social development, marriage, uh, some of you will get married or are married. Uh, the statistics are correct. A good portion of you will divorce. Uh, the statistics are also correct. A good portion of divorced will remarry. Uh, so you can expect that at least in your connections with other people, there will be change over the course of time. Career development, uh, expect to change jobs or even your career. Uh, so gone are the days of individuals staying with the same company. For example, if you work for somebody else for their whole career, uh, best of advice that I got uh, when I got my first job is start looking for your next job, and that's the case. Academics are a little bit uh, more insulated from sort of change, I guess, uh, from quarter to quarter as, as you find in industry. Uh, that's the beauty of tenure. Um, but uh, for most people, you can expect to change jobs uh, every couple of years. Um, some people uh, head down one particular direction in their career and then they choose to, to change careers. It's really difficult. It could be stressful, but it's possible. So some people will even change their careers at some point. Physical changes certainly will develop those characteristic signs of aging. That is, our appearance will change. We'll lose that elasticity in our skin and we'll begin to sag and wrinkle and so forth. Uh, we'll experience the inevitable decline in physical health. If you're lucky to have a good set of genes and you've taken care of yourself through diet and exercise and so forth, you'll do better than those who don't have a good set of genes or don't take care of themselves. But physical changes we can expect certainly to occur over, over time. And then cognitive changes, that's the last thing I want to mention. Now, there's no good evidence to suggest that our IQ falls as we age, what happens is a general mental slowing down. That is, elderly people, older people can't multitask to the extent that young people can. That is, it takes more time to process information and make decisions and that sort of thing. So the next time you get behind an individual who's driving slow, just keep in mind if it's an individual that's elderly or an older or older adult, keep in mind that they're... Uh, th their mental processing is not quite as fast as yours, so try to be a little bit more patient with those individuals as you uh, drive the speed limit or below it in some cases. So the learning objectives for this lecture, describe, compare, and contrast Piaget's stages of cognitive development, describe, compare, and contrast Kohlberg's stages of moral development, identify the various problems, criticisms of the stage theories, Describe the physical and cognitive changes associated with aging. Describe Marsha's identity statuses and explain how the identity statuses are related to age. Describe and compare, compare and contrast Erickson's stages of personality development. So these last three are red font objectives. That means we haven't talked about them in lecture and you'll need to read about them in the text and you can expect quiz questions on these objectives.